Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Mike Bradbury. The person who should be introducing this uh, webinar, sadly, is sick today. So uh, they've asked me just to give a quick introduction before we enter the webinar properly. Um, I'm here in the north of England where it's sunny uh, but cold. I don't know uh, where in the world you might be, uh, but whatever it is, I hope the weather's good for you. Uh, this webinar is sponsored by Prophecy Labs. Prophecy Labs is a company that uh, has developed an AI-driven uh, FinOps application that pulls together in a single platform the functionality of what is typically a variety of different products. So if you want more information on Prophecy Labs, you can go to their website. But the focus of this presentation is to look at the sustainability of cloud IT and strategies for how we reduce cloud waste. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by cloud waste as we go through. I'm Mike Bradbury. I'm a FinOps certified professional and FinOps certified instructor. Uh, so I've spent the last three years or so working with the FinOps Foundation, helping to develop the FinOps framework. I'm a co-author of several papers that you can find at finops.org on adopting FinOps, encouraging engineers to take action on FinOps and gamifying FinOps. So all of that material is at finops.org along with a lot of other stuff about the FinOps Foundation. And maybe this is a good time to say uh, the FinOps Foundation is a not-for-profit organization uh, with over 10,000 members now worldwide. Uh, and these members over the last few years have helped create the FinOps framework from their own experience. So what we have at FinOps uh, org or the FinOps Foundation is an ongoing, not-for-profit, open source model that anyone can access who's interested in learning more about FinOps. So with that in mind, let's take a look at what we're talking about here, which is the sustainability of cloud IT. And uh, I don't know how many of you would be aware of this, but around 3% of all greenhouse gas emissions worldwide come from data centers. And that's more than the entire aviation industry or the entire shipping industry. So a lot of greenhouse gases come from data centers. And as you can see from the right-hand picture here, much of this is generated by the IT sector itself. So yeah, uh, banks, uh, insurance companies, retail companies, they all use cloud IT too. But uh, the sector that uses most cloud IT is the actual information computing and technology sector. And as you can see from this graph, the energy consumption of data centers worldwide is accelerating upwards from 2013 to 2021. There's no reason to assume that that growth has slowed since this uh, graphic was created a couple of years ago. So uh, greenhouse gas emissions from data centers are accelerating upwards because many of these data centers that are uh, fueling the IT cloud IT worldwide are located in areas where there's still mostly uh, fossil fuel generated electricity. Uh, most data centers sit within areas of high fossil fuel generation and very few of them sit within uh, renewable energy zones. So the energy consumed by these data centers translates into higher uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And the problem's getting worse. So as we saw then, uh, we've got an accelerating pattern of cloud use, 
data center, energy consumption, and greenhouse gas emissions. That's all accelerating anyway, and probably would continue to accelerate anyway without artificial intelligence. But as we all know, over the last 12 months, particularly uh, chat GPT and generative AI in general has become hugely popular. It's probably the single most searched for interested in term uh, on Google and when it comes to IT. So artificial intelligence is huge, uh, but artificial intelligence is gonna make our data center emissions problem way worse than it would be otherwise, because AI demands huge amounts of data, far more data than traditional systems are likely to need. So we need to generate more data, store more, more data, process more data, which means we need more storage equipment, which means we need, need more processing power, which we, means we need new processing technologies, new uh, microprocessors, new graphical uh, processing units. And all of these technologies require energy to create and run and support. Uh, and in fact, in data centers, one of the major sources of energy consumption is uh, the cooling systems to keep this technology at the correct working temperature. So here we have a foreseeable problem. We can see data center use is going up. We can see energy consumption is going up. We can see greenhouse gases are going up and we know they're accelerating upward at a faster and faster rate. So what do we propose to do about that? The first thing to recognize is that around 30% of all this stuff is gonna be waste. In fact, I think probably uh, with AI set to generate huge numbers of applications that perhaps no one wants, uh, that number might be closer to 50 or 60% is waste. But at any rate, what we know right now from surveys that are done in the industry is around 30% of cloud IT resources are wasted. Uh, so what we can do about our problem begins with what we can control. And one of the things we can control is how much of cloud IT we're currently wasting. So when I say cloud waste, what do I actually mean? What I mean by cloud waste are any resources that any organization has running in the cloud that they don't need. They don't need them either because they were uh, bought for an application that's no longer needed. At any rate, they're a resource who had, which had a purpose in the past, but no longer has a purpose. But yet that resource is still running. It's still costing money. It's still generating carbon emissions. Clearly, that's waste. There are other workloads running in the cloud, which are way too big for what's needed. They're more powerful, more energy hungry, more greenhouse gas emitting than is necessary to do the job that's required. That is waste. There's plenty of stuff running in the cloud, which is running on old, out of date architectures, on old technologies. Those could be replaced by cloud native architectures based on microservices, uh, APIs, uh, containers, uh, or modernized into new hardware that runs much more energy efficiently and generates lower emissions. And finally, there are many data centers around the world, as I already said before, that sit within high carbon zones. By working with our cloud suppliers 
we can move our cloud usage into areas where there's a huge amount of renewable energy and reduce the emissions from our cloud use. So when I talk about cloud waste here, I'm talking about cloud usage we have that's running either because we don't need it anymore, but it's still running. It's running way too big and we could make it smaller and emit less greenhouse gas and pay less money for it. It's running on old architectures or infrastructure that could be modernized to be made more efficient, or it's running in areas where we're burning fossil fuels to power it. So all of this, all of that is what I mean by cloud waste. And that's what we're going to try and get rid of and what we're going to talk about in the rest of this webinar. I'd like to draw a parallel here with restaurants. Because up until recently, most of the IT infrastructure we ran was in data centers that were owned by the organizations themselves. And in these data centers, we put hardware that we had bought and is then run for our developers and architects to work on. This is a little bit like a buffet meal, a little bit like a restaurant where all the food is already prepared, it's laid out, you've paid the bill already, and all you need to do is eat whatever you want from what's on offer. So whoever created this restaurant has already ordered, had delivered, prepared, and served all the food that's available to eat. All their costs are already sunk in this restaurant. The bill has already been paid, it's all there. It doesn't matter how much or how little you eat, it doesn't change your bill. You have a limited number of options, but so far as you're concerned as the consumer, as the customer, it's all now free. Now, I think we can see in this model, there's likely to be a lot of waste. If you run in a restaurant like this, after everyone's gone, after everyone's gone after lunch or after dinner, there's gonna be a lot of food left over, I suppose. I suppose in many restaurants, they do something with that. But nonetheless, from our point of view, that looks like waste. The problem is you can't do anything about it now. It's too late to do anything about that waste now. The bill's already been paid, the food's already been prepared, it's already laid out, you can't do anything with it, it's too late. And that's like our IT data center. What's ordered in a data center is predicted in advance. How much IT are we gonna use for the next few years? Generally, what is bought will cost millions of dollars, maybe tens of millions of dollars. So it's a big decision. But you don't have to make that decision very often. You're going to buy data centers or equipment for data centers maybe every year, maybe every three years, maybe every five years. So it's a few very big financial decisions. That's the characteristic of the data center restaurant or the IT data center. The cloud, on the other hand, is quite different. The cloud is more like an a la carte restaurant where you can order whatever you like from a massive menu of choices. And all of those choices are available to you. You just pick what you want. So in the data center, you had a limited number of choices. In the cloud, you've got virtually unlimited choices. You can have just whatever you want. Not only that, you can have it delivered virtually instantaneously. You can write a few lines of code, have the infrastructure ready, have it provisioned, and start using it inside a matter of minutes. This is a different world. But there are two major differences between the cloud a la carte restaurant and the data center restaurant. In the cloud a la carte restaurant, you are charged for absolutely everything. So you walk in the door of the restaurant, 
you're charged to, to walk in, you're charged to hang your coat up, you're charged for the table you sit at, you're charged for the glasses and the plates on the table, you're charged for the water, you're charged every time a, a waiter comes up and takes your order, you're charged for absolutely everything. You're charged per 100 grams of potato. You're charged per uh, 100 mils, milliliters of water. You're charged for every P you put on your plate. Each separate thing in the cloud a la carte restaurant triggers a separate bill. So, although in an actual restaurant where you're eating, the bill might only have six or seven lines. In the cloud restaurant, if you're in the AWS restaurant or the Google Cloud restaurant or the Microsoft Azure restaurant, your bill could be thousands, hundreds of thousands of lines long every month. Why is that? Well, there's two reasons. Firstly, you're charged for everything you use, but most of the things you're using, you ordered last month or the month before that or the month before that again. So what you're charged for this month isn't just what you've had this month. It's everything you're currently using, all the things you've ordered for previous months and years that are still running, you're going to get a charge for all of those. And there will be thousands of them. Well, there'll be thousands of them if you have a big organization. But it doesn't stop there. Not only are you charged for everything you order, you're charged for every second that you're using it. So, so if you if you have a plate on your table for 10 minutes, that triggers a 10-minute charge. If you have a plate on your table for an hour, that charges a 60-minute charge. If your coat is hanging up in the cloakroom for three hours, you've got to charge for three hours. So all of these things are time and usage dependent. So this is a massively, massively complicated problem. You've got thousands and thousands of transactions. You're being charged for every little thing you have. And these charges depend on how long you're using it for. Or in the case of data, how many terabytes you're storing and how long you're storing it for. Or in the case of data transfer, how many terabytes of data you're moving backwards and forwards. So these charges are typically very small in themselves, but you may have hundreds of thousands of them each month because, as I say, every month you're paying for everything you've ordered in the past that you're still running. So you might think now, well, why? Why would anyone use cloud? It looks incredibly complicated. Well, it is complicated, but of course people use cloud because of the ability to create new resources very quickly, use them very quickly, and turn them off very quickly. The problem is, Many organizations are quick to trigger these things up, quick to order them, quick to use them, but very slow to turn them off again when they're no longer needed. And, and I'd, I've got an example of this. I've got a Spotify account. I don't use Spotify very much, but I pay, uh, I think, £9.99 a month for Spotify every month, whether I use it or not. And I keep it going. Every month I see the bill, I think, you know what? I should turn that off, but I don't. And I guess you're probably similar in that regard. But okay, for us as consumers, we're talking about a few pounds here and there. If you're a large enterprise running cloud, this could be hundreds of thousands of euro, maybe millions of euro a month that is being wasted for the stuff you're using, you bought, you're still paying for, it's still generating carbon from the data center it's running in, but you're not using it. You don't need it anymore. Something you had before you don't need anymore, but you haven't turned it off. You haven't shrunk it to be the right size. You haven't modernized it so it's more efficient. You've just left it there emitting gas and costing you money. That sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? 
well, it, I think it sounds bad to me. The good thing about cloud, though, is it's never too late to do something about that. In the data center, it was too late. The money had already been sunk. The stuff had already been bought. With cloud, if you decide right now, this afternoon, this Wednesday afternoon, you're going to turn some resources off in the cloud, then the bill stops there. You won't be paying for that tomorrow. So you can do something about it. Waste is controllable in the cloud, but how do we do it? That's the question. How do we do it? The answer is we do it with FinOps. And really we do it with a FinOps team of people. I should say here that FinOps uh, as a word is a combination of finance and DevOps. So FinOps is bringing finance and DevOps together so that organizations can get the best value from cloud. FinOps was created to manage the value of the cloud as measured in terms of money, as measured in terms of dollars or euros or pounds. It wasn't created to measure that, to maximize the value of cloud in terms of carbon emissions. But in fact, it's the best tool we have for managing the emissions that come from cloud, just as it's the best tool we have for managing the costs that come out of our use of cloud. So a FinOps team can easily manage the cloud emissions of their cloud usage, just as they manage the cost of their cloud usage. So you might say, well, why do we need, why do we need a team of people? Why do we need executives, finance people, engineers, product people? Why do these guys need to collaborate on cloud uh, management, on usage management, on emissions management? Well, the answer is uh, no single persona can own everything that's going on. Product owners determine what they want for their product, and that drives what engineering teams want to buy or need to buy in the cloud. Executives determine the strategy for the organization, and they dictate the direction and how important emissions and cloud value is to the organization. And finance teams manage costs, report on costs, manage budgets, manage forecasts and so on, and so are responsible for the financial framework within all of this operates. So it's only possible to manage the value of cloud, whether that's in terms of money or emissions, it's only possible to manage the value of cloud with a complete cross-functional team, with a collaborative approach. We're in this together. It's not just an engineering problem. It's not just a product problem. It's not just a finance problem. It's everyone's problem. It's a problem for the organization. And in fact, when we talk about emissions, it's a problem for all the rest of us too, because we're all living on the earth. Uh, we're all human beings that have a stake in the future of our planet. So the point, the key point I want to make out of this presentation is that one thing we can do for managing the sustainability of cloud is to manage what we're wasting in cloud, to minimize what we're wasting in cloud. And the way to minimize what we're wasting in cloud is to create a FinOps team, have an effective FinOps team in the organization. And for that team to operate successfully, we need, we need them to understand how cloud works and how cloud waste works, where it comes from and what can be done about it. So we need education. We need teams who use cloud to own their own cloud usage, to be accountable for the cost of that cloud usage, both in terms of money and in terms of carbon emissions. The teams that use cloud need to be accountable for the costs and emissions that it produces. Those teams 
if they are to be accountable, need to be able to see what cost and what emissions are resulting from their cloud usage. So visibility is a key factor. And that's where products like Prophecies products and all the other cloud tools that are on the market, that's where they help by showing, by displaying on dashboards and in reports what is being used, what it's costing, what it's costing in terms of dollars, what it's costing in terms of emissions. We need metrics, metrics that mean something. We had a presentation in London a couple of weeks ago where uh, the FinOps uh, leader at Just Eat, I, I don't know which countries uh, the listeners to this webinar are in, but in the UK, the business Just Eat delivers food to your home. And they have a metric for their cloud usage, which is cost per thousand orders. So there's a metric that's tailored to their business. It's meaningful to their business. The cloud costs of processing each 1000 orders. They could just as easily have carbon emissions per 1000 orders. That would be an easy metric to create. It would be an easy metric to track. And that in itself would make quite a big difference to the emissions, uh, to the attention that the, that the engineers and the teams in Just Eat, uh, the attention that they gave cloud waste, carbon emissions per 1,000 orders. So we need metrics. And finally, we need the organization to be encouraged to focus on waste. We need a mindful approach to waste, just like we have a mindful approach to all the other types of waste, plastic waste and so on. We have a mindful approach to that now, thanks to the work of various bodies over the last 10 or 20 years. We don't like the idea of plastics uh, in the oceans and littering our landscape. So we have a mindful approach to what we're gonna do with plastic. We should have the mindful approach to what we're gonna do with cloud waste. We can't mindlessly sail into the future, developing new cloud applications and using artificial intelligence without any thought of the consequences of that. We need a mindful approach. Okay, I talked a bit earlier about the FinOps Foundation. I'm not gonna talk through this complicated picture, but this is what the FinOps framework looks like. It's the blueprint for organizations who want to do something about cloud waste. As you can see, just very quickly, the FinOps framework has six principles to guide action. It has five personas, the roles and responsibilities people have for managing cloud. It has phases, a life cycle, inform, optimize, optimate, and it optimize an iterative process for improving cloud value and reducing cloud waste. It has domains of activity that FinOps teams and teams within the organization need to engage with to manage cloud responsibly. And finally, it has a maturity scale, crawl, walk, run, uh, to measure how uh, you're developing, how you're developing your FinOps skills as you progress. So the FinOps framework has been drawn up progressively over the last five years or so uh, by the membership of the FinOps Foundation, over 10,000 members worldwide. You, I, I would encourage you to join the FinOps Foundation. You can do so free of charge uh, and you can contribute to the FinOps framework. It's not set in stone. It's developing all the time as we learn more about how to manage cloud and as new cloud technologies uh, come onto the market. So this is a very live product and you can help develop it if you join the FinOps Foundation. So that's the blueprint that we have for managing cloud value, both in terms of money and in terms of uh, carbon emissions. I'm just checking how we're doing for time. I think we're just about on track. 
So FinOps is the answer. I think it's it's a good, this would be a good moment just to recap where we've come in this story so far. Because what comes after this is how we might tackle it. So where we've come from, data centers around the world emit quite a lot of carbon, quite a lot of greenhouse gases. And that is going up and up and up every year. As, as cloud becomes more popular, it's gonna go up faster. As artificial intelligence becomes more popular, it's gonna go up faster still. Right now, there is no sign that that is going to slow down. No sign at all. I mean, if there's anybody in this room that thinks people are gonna stop using cloud, or people are gonna stop developing AI applications, well then put something in the chat to that effect and maybe we can talk about it afterwards. But all the indications are cloud use is going to continue to accelerate and AI is gonna accelerate it faster, which means that unless we move all the data centers into renewable energy zones, which in the short term isn't going to happen either, unless we do that, emissions are going to accelerate upwards as usage accelerates. So there we've got a problem. Cloud use is going to accelerate. Data center emissions are going to accelerate. FinOps, we know, is the answer. But FinOps is hard to do. It's hard to change the way organizations work so that they can be more collaborative, so they can educate their workforce, provide the visibility these teams need and organize them into teams that are going to make cloud use more efficient. That's not an easy, simple, quick thing to do. Meanwhile, the problem we're tackling is, is accelerating away from us. So it is a problem that FinOps adoption is difficult and as a result of being difficult, it's slow. So what we need is a way of accelerating it. And on this slide, I'm just showing that it, it's relatively easy to affect what you're paying for cloud. The rate you play, pay for cloud resources is relatively easy to reduce that because you can go to your cloud provider and say, well, look, if we commit to using this amount of cloud for the next 12 months or for the next three years, we can get a discount. Okay, let's get that discount. Let's pay 20% less, 30% less, 40% less. That way we save money. Sure, that's true. You save money and that's relatively quick to do. But you don't change your usage. If your usage is wasteful now, it's still going to be wasteful after you've got those discounts. You'll just be paying less for it, but you're still burning the same amount of energy. You're still generating the same amount of carbon you're still doing the same amount of damage to the climate and the atmosphere. So changing your cloud rate doesn't affect sustainability. The only thing that affects sustainability of your cloud use is changing what is used. Using less or using more efficient resources, that's the only thing that changes your emissions. So optimizing cloud usage means changing the working patterns of the organization, changing the way engineers work, changing the solutions architects design, changing how product owners see what they need to create next, changing how finance teams keep track of what's going on in these thousands of small transactions every month. It means changing the way the organization works. It means a new perspective. So that's difficult. And it's no surprise that as of 2023, very few organizations that are adopting FinOps are yet seeing any great business value from it because it's hard to do. And the reason why it's hard to do is mainly down to people. If you want to change the way people operate, that's difficult. People don't generally want to change 
the way they operate. Unless they see an, an urgent, compelling need to change, they probably aren't going to change. And the FinOps Foundation does a survey every year called the State of FinOps Survey. And here I've reproduced one of the graphics from the uh, 2023 State of FinOps Survey. Uh, and in the survey, responders were asked, what are the biggest problems you have in implementing FinOps in your organization? And the six biggest problems that organizations have all relate to changing the way the people work. Uh, this is quite a small graphic, or the text is quite small, so you may not be able to see it. But I'll just run quickly through the top six problems. The big pain points are empowering engineers to take action, getting to unit economics, organizational adoption of FinOps, reducing waste or unused resources, implementing FinOps governance and policy of scale, and accurate forecasting of spend. All of those six issues are related to how people work, how engineers work, how, how metrics work, how the organizational, or how the organization uh, collaborates or doesn't collaborate on cloud. All of these Things are how people work, and they are what's making it slow to adopt FinOps, those people problems. So when we see right now AWS reInvent is, is on in San Diego uh, or Las Vegas, wherever it is, uh, and LinkedIn is full of posts about all these super-duper new tools and technologies that everybody's terribly excited about, for a week or two at least, uh, that isn't where the problem lies. Yes, we can have all these new technologies, but it's simply not sustainable unless we get to grips with the waste that is being generated and the greenhouse gases that that waste is going to emit into our atmosphere. And the reason why those problems exist is that organizations are very fast to adopt the new latest technology, but very slow to get themselves organized and to get their people organized to manage the way cloud is used, manage the way waste is reduced. They're very slow to do that. It's taken a long time. So what we need to do is accelerate that. Uh, how do we do that? How do we speed this process up? How do we get organizations to adopt FinOps more quickly and uh, take an interest in this uh, key skill of managing how much technology we're wasting, manage how much greenhouse gases we're pumping into the atmosphere? How do we accelerate this plan? Well, there's some good news. Sustainability is a motivator. The people in, order, in organizations care about climate change. The organization may not care very much, but the people, the individual people in the organization, they do care. And so that's something we can use. That's a lever we can use to encourage more rapid adoption of FinOps. One of my colleagues here in the UK did a survey recently. He's doing a new survey uh, now, and I'd like you to contribute to that one. Um, I don't know how I can get the survey link to you. I can do it maybe through prophecy. But uh, we're doing this survey to see what motivates people in organizations. Are they mainly motivated by reducing the cost of cloud infrastructure? or are they mainly motivated by reducing the carbon emissions of cloud infrastructure? And 70% of respondents said they're motivated more by reducing greenhouse gas emissions than they are motivated by cost. That's not surprising. It was particularly true in Europe, where five times as many people said, they were motivated to reduce 
carbon emissions uh, as opposed to being motivated to reduce costs. So when we talk about FinOps, and we talk about FinOps as a means of reducing cloud costs and increasing cloud value in terms of dollars, we may be missing the main opportunity we have here. And that is adopting FinOps also reduces greenhouse gases. Adopting FinOps also increases the value of your cloud infrastructure as measured by carbon use, okay? Not by dollars, by carbon. So if, as I said before, Just Eat change their metric from cost per thousand orders to carbon emissions per thousand orders, there would be a metric that they could track and which their workforce would more readily be motivated by. So there's, I would say we replace cost as a metric. There's no reason why we can't have both these metrics. There's no reason why we don't want to track cost and carbon emissions. In fact, of course, we need to do both of those things. But the point I want to make here is FinOps adoption is slow and we need it to be fast. To make it fast, we've got a lever that people are interested in sustainability. People are motivated by wanting to act on the climate. And one way we can act on the climate is by reducing cloud waste. And the way we do that is by getting to FinOps faster, okay? That's the point I want to make. So we need to inspire our teams to drive sustainable cloud, to get people working together to drive sustainable cloud. Product teams control the usage of cloud resources, so the problem probably begins with them, but it's a collaborative effort. And these teams love a challenge, so we should give them a challenge. We should have a people-focused strategy for FinOps. We should have an executive, a chief executive that's prepared to stand up and say they care about emissions, they care about cloud waste, and the organization wants the people in it to be empowered to act on it. With a people-focused strategy, we can empower cloud ownership, we can educate our workforce, we can challenge product teams to design products that are more energy efficient as well as more cost, effi cost efficient. And we should be rewarding these teams for their achievements, celebrating their achievement. And in that way, we create high performing teams that are good for the organization in terms of staff retention and staff motivation. This is great. They're good for the value the organization is getting out of cloud and the competitive advantage they're getting from cloud, but they're also good for all the rest of us in terms of managing the amount of emissions that come out of data centers worldwide, which as we've seen is a growing problem. So here's my vision for the future with this people-focused FinOps strategy. It would be wonderful to see teams that are challenged to, to deliver, not just on costs, but on carbon emissions. Let's make that a challenge that runs alongside the cost reduction, the value creation side of cloud technology. Teams that have visibility of real-time emissions data as well as cost data, they can see what the usage of cloud is doing in terms of emissions minute by minute, day by day. Teams that are measured, whose performance is measured by carbon emissions in terms of being incorporated to objectives and key results and key performance indicators. And teams that are working every day, day by day in a continuous process to optimize use of cloud, not just for money, but for carbon emissions as well. This is a never ending job. It's not something you do once you adopt FinOps and then forget about it. Unfortunately, This is a lifetime sentence. There is no target state here. We're never going to be able to sit back and say, it's job done. That is not going to happen. It's an ongoing, everyday job 
forever. That's the end of this webinar. Uh, thank you for listening. I'd just like to leave you with one thought, and that is accelerating the adoption of FinOps is just such a beautiful challenge. Where else could you have a strategy that would generate more money by saving wasted costs and be good for all the rest of humanity as well? What a beautiful challenge to have. Thank you very much. Okay. I've opened up the uh, Q&A box if anybody wants to uh, have some questions. I'll take a quick look at the chat because I haven't seen anything in there yet. Okay, there is a, a question in the chat. What would I recommend to start to implement FinOps if you're a small startup? Well, I think if you're a small startup, you're in a perfect situation. Uh, you don't have entrenched uh, methods of working, patterns of working that you need to undo. You can start. I would say the first thing you should possibly do is get one of your team to do the FinOps practitioner course at finops.org. That will cost you a few hundred dollars, but when that member of your team has done that course, he will be able to guide you to adopting FinOps step by step in an iterative way so that as you grow, your cloud use will be more and more efficient and your waste will be minimized. If anybody wants to ask a question of me directly, they can send an email to me at mike at finops.ninja. So I'll leave this channel open in case there are any more questions. Uh, but if not, that's great. I hope you've enjoyed the webinar. Uh, please get in touch with me at mike at finops.ninja if you have uh, any questions for me.